Hello, I'm Pori Carmody from the Geography Department at Trinity College Dublin and I want to talk to you today about geography and what it means to study geography at Trinity College. For a lot of people when they think about geography they think about maps, they think about the names of capital cities and countries, some of the things maybe that you learnt in primary school. But when you get to university, geography is a very different kind of subject and discipline. We're more interested in analysing things, in analysing spatial patterns and thinking about uh, why the world is the way that it is and how do we explain differences between places. We're also interested in giving people applied skills. So geographers, when they come out, um, typically employers find them very valuable employees because they've learned things like geographic information system skills or uh, skills with statistics or other forms of analysis. So I want to talk to you a little bit more today uh, about that. Traditionally geography has often used maps as an important tool. So maps are a static representation of spatial information in two dimensions. So the previous geographers in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, maps were their main tools. Today, today though, geographers use different tools. Um, as part of the change to a global informational economy, geography has developed uh, these new computerized and digitized ways of analyzing the world. And that's one of the things that you get when you come to do a degree at Trinity College. In particular, we're interested in, as I said, analyzing things and also explaining how things change across space. So we're interested in social processes and we're interested in the physical geography of how things change and how those th two things work together. Some of the tools geographers use now are things like remote sensing, satellite data, so you see a photo uh, of a satellite here. Uh, satellites can pick up changes in crop patterns, for example. Other tools we use now are things like Google Earth and, as I mentioned previously, geographic information systems. But maps retain their fundamental importance and we can think of these new tools that geographers use as having maps at their kind of core or base to enable us to think about where things are, why they are there and how things change through time. Our tools have become more sophisticated in recent years as well, so that we can actually represent things in three dimensions now. So this is a digital elevation model of South Dublin and the Dublin Mountains using SPOT uh, satellite data. SPOT is a, a French uh, satellite system and it's one of the main ways that geographers get access to data um, from, from satellites. Geography is an increasingly important discipline as well if we want to understand the world and the way it's evolving both in terms of its physical and social environment. Um, we're interested in things like major challenges facing global society, international development, um, how can we understand how places can become more developed. Um, the photo there is showing you an example of a low carbon stove the Darfur or so-called Darfur stove which has been developed at the University of California Berkeley. We have researchers at Trinity who are working on a similar stove um, except this one will actually let you recharge your mobile phone in addition to generating heat for cooking. Um, the other photo there is a Ross water purifier and there are over a billion people around the world who don't have access to safe and clean drinking water. And this is a way both of transporting water and also purifying it for people in low-income countries around the world. We're interested in environmental changes. We're interested in things like global climate change. How do we explain that? And the process of globalization. How is it that we understand how places are increasingly interlinked uh, together? What's driving that? What is the nature of those interlinkages and how does it uh, affect different places in different ways? So some of the key questions geographers are interested in addressing at the moment are things like why are some places rich and some places poor? Why is it that the world's three richest people have assets which are higher than what the poorest 600 million people earn in a year? How do we explain that uneven geography of development? Why is it that the economy of sub-Saharan Africa, excluding South Africa, is about the same size as that of Belgium or Texas. 
Other questions that political geographers are, in, are interested in are things like why do some places or countries suffer from political instability? When we read about places like Darfur in Western Sudan, how do we explain that conflict? Is it to do with local conditions? Is it to do with global climate change and resource competition over access to water and land? How do we understand conflict and how do we think about how to reduce conflict? One of the traditional concerns of geographers is the physical environment. Mountains, valleys, lakes. How do we understand how these landscapes, these physical lands landscapes are created and changed through time? And geographers are also interested in human landscapes, in the urban environment. How do we understand why some places, some cities have skyscrapers and others don't? And they're interested in the interaction as well between the physical and the human environment. So for example, many cities have microclimates where the temperature can vary by a few degrees based on the buildings in that place, rather than what the conditions that would prevail under a, a totally uh, natural environment. So how do we explain and account for those kinds of landscapes and how they change through time? One of the things I mentioned previously is global climate change. And some people have argued that this is perhaps the most important challenge facing humankind in the coming century. But global climate change will affect different places very differently. Some places like the United States, um, only 13% of their economy, for example, is dependent on uh, areas where the climate has an impact, so like agriculture. So most of their economy is based on services and manufacturing, which won't be uh, badly affected necessarily by climate change. But if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, there's a very different picture. The majority of people in Sub-Saharan Africa are dependent for their livelihoods on agriculture. And cruelly, it will be Sub-Saharan Africa, or at least this is what the, UN t the United Nations tells us, which will be most affected by global climate change. One estimate has it that the value of crops produced in Sub-Saharan Africa could fall by 90% by the year uh, uh, 2100 um, if the current pattern of climate change uh, continues. So how do we think through this geography of global climate change? How is Africa or Ireland affected? What kinds of policies can be put in place to try and uh, reduce or reverse the effects of climate change? How can communities mitigate and protect themselves from the worst effects of global climate change? So this is a major area of interest uh, in the geography department at Trinity, one of the things that you'll be exposed to if you uh, choose to come and study here. Another major subfield of geography is health geography and ge health geographers are interested in things like how diseases spread across space and how can they be combated. I mentioned a few minutes ago about the process of globalization that is that places are increasingly becoming linked up around the world through flows of investment, trade, ideas and information. But diseases are also spreading around the world. Some people talk about diseases of globalization, like avian or swine flu or HIV and AIDS. How do we understand how these diseases emerge and how they spread across space and how they can be combated? This is a map um, from the magazine National Geographic, which is produced in the US, showing the geography of swine flu, swine flu. Uh, from 2009. So as you can see on the first map there, there's a representation of the risk of the spread of sw uh, swine flu with the countries in red or the, the darker red um, showing extreme risk. The second map shows the capacity to contain and you see there's a very different geography. So whereas Canada and Russia show extreme risk in terms of the spread, the uncontained spread of the uh, disease swine flu, the, their capacity to contain the disease is much greater because they have uh, much greater economic resources and better developed health systems than the countries of sub-Saharan Africa, which appear in red, as you see on the second map. So there's this kind of differential geography where you have the interaction between economics or economic geography and disease. 
And then the third map shows you the risk of emergence. Um, swine flu, uh, we think, emerged in certain parts of the developing world. So you can see there's uh, an interaction between these different physical, social, economic and even political factors which will determine how the disease might emerge, how it might spread and how prepared countries are to contain and ultimately uh, eliminate uh, diseases such as this. This is you know, a, an example of the kind of approach that geographers would take to examining these kinds of global problems. There's three ways that you can come into geography at Trinity College. Um, the first one is to come in through general science entry, TR071. When you come on in through TR071, you come in, you study a variety of subjects. Um, depending on the particular choices you make, you might study chemistry, biology, geography in combination with other things. And then if you find that you enjoy geography, it's something that appeals to you, uh, then you can uh, specialise in geography in your third and fourth year of your degree. The second way to come into geography is through uh, arts entry or what we call here two subject moderatorship. That's where you choose to study geography in combination with another subject in the arts faculty. So for example uh, history or we have a new um, degree as well uh, which is not through arts but geography and political science uh, as you see there uh, on the fourth bullet point. The third way that you can do it, that you can study geography, is through the earth science, the new earth science degree, which combines geography uh, and geology. So in total there are four ways of coming in uh, to study geography at Trinity College. So depending on what your interests are, if you're of a more scientific bent, or if you're more interested in social is issues and arts and humanities, uh, you might choose to come in and study it in a different way. So what kinds of courses uh, do we have here? You'll see in years one and two, our um, interest is in getting people to think about these different branches of geography, physical geography, getting an understanding of the basics of global climate change and physical landscapes. Environmental geography, which looks at how it is that uh, these social and economic factors that I talked about interact with the physical environment. And then finally, human geography. So looking at things like the spread of disease or understanding how globalization affects different places. The kinds of courses that you take in your second year are things like Changing Worlds. And Changing Worlds is a course which takes globalization as its theme. It looks at uh, issues around third world development, for example. How do we explain why Latin America or Sub-Saharan Africa are relatively poor? and why other places are rich and the interactions between those different kinds of places. I mentioned as well that we have gotten very good feedback from employers about the skill set that geography graduates have. And one of the things that we do during the course of the degree is teach people to analyse and collect uh, data. And we begin to do that through a research methods course in your second year. Another thing that makes geography distinct is that we run small groups seminars. So rather than sitting in large lectures, um, what you do in your second year is you have small group seminars where maybe you um, read an article and then discuss with one of your professors or lecturers and do a piece of writing. So it's really an opportunity for you to um, get that kind of one-on-one -on -one feedback and to develop your writing and analytical skills and that's something which is really invaluable in the later years of the degree. In years three and four you have an opportunity to specialise more in areas that are of particular uh, interest to you. So I won't through, read through the uh, entire list there but you'll see the kinds of topics that are available to you. Uh, hydrology, the study of water, coastal processes, uh, African development. So we have a range of specialisms uh, in the department. And another thing that makes geography particularly appealing uh, and not, if not unique then certainly distinctive is the emphasis on field trips. So you'll get to actually go and uh, with a lecturer or a professor and undertake research in the field. And that's one of the things that really uh, makes geography different from many other disciplines is to get that kind of hands-on experience of collecting your own data 
and getting out and talking to people or undertaking physical experiments. These are some photos from the different field trips that we've run. So as you see, we've taken students to places like Iceland, um, the third year field trip uh, to Mallorca. You'll see there the picture from 2008. And also in some of the master's programs that geography staff are involved in, students get to go even further afield. So for example, you'll see a photo there from a field trip uh, to Kenya in 2003. And we have other new master's programs which enable students to go to uh, Rwanda for field work as well. So those master's programs that the geography department are involved in are the MSc in Environment and Development, MSc in Environment, uh, Environmental Science, the MSc in Biodiversity and Conservation, and the new two-year master's in Development Practice where the students will spend three months on field work uh, in Rwanda. So by doing an undergraduate degree in geography, it opens up the possibility for you to continue on to a master's program if that's something that's of interest to you, or if you're interested in a more academic career, then again after that to continue on to do um, doctoral studies or a PhD. So some examples of the kinds of things that uh, PhD students are studying in the department are biodiversity politics in Ireland, conflict around special economic zones in India, urban renewal programs in Dublin, and climate change records. One of the things that we try and do in the department is to link up the research that the different staff are doing to their teaching. And one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is globalization and development. My research focuses on Southern Africa, and in the last number of years, I've been particularly interested in the impacts of tri Chinese trade and investment on that part of the continent. I also have a grant from the National Science Foundation in the United States which is looking at how small businesses in Tanzania and South Africa are using mobile phones, email and internet. Now Sub-Saharan Africa, if you read in the popular media, is often portrayed as a place of conflict, poverty and disease. But there's a different side to Sub-Saharan Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa has some of the fastest growing economies in the world. Poverty reduction, the United Nations thinks, has been taking place over the last decade or so in the subcontinent. And one of the other things of note in recent years is the very, very rapid adoption of mobile phone technology across the continent. You'll see on this map here uh, the fact the, that the average annual growth rate for mobile phone uh, usage in Sub-Saharan Africa between 1999 and 2004 was 58 percent, over 58% a year. So there's this very rapid diffusion of this new technology across Sub-Saharan Africa. What does that mean? It means that people can get access to information about healthcare. For farmers, they can find out about prices, where's the best place to sell their crops to get the highest price. So this is uh, a project that is interested in finding out how it is that small businesses are affected by these new technologies. Does it open up real potential for economic transformation uh, in these countries of Sub-Saharan Africa? Another one of my interests is around, um, as I mentioned, Chinese investment in Sub-Saharan Africa. Some people talk about the new scramble for Africa, that the major economic powers around the world, the United States, China, France, Britain, Russia, Brazil, are increasingly interested in accessing critical natural resources like oil or copper in Sub-Saharan Africa. And as the global population expands, and as the global economy uh, will expand further into the future, there's going to be increasing pressure on natural resources around the world. And one of the things that people have identified is competition around access to land in particular. And in, in the case of Sub-Saharan Africa, some of this land is being used for growing biofuels. So growing wheat or maize, which can, can then be turned into petrol to run our cars. But what are the impacts of this biofuel uh, revolution as some people have called it. It drives up prices for food and also requires large tracts of land to grow these biofuels. 
So are the impacts of biofuel development on Africa positive or negative, or are they good for some people and bad for other people? So this is another kind of uh, question that geographers are interested in addressing. I hope you find this uh, presentation useful. If you have uh, other questions, uh, please feel free to get in touch with us. And also, please check out our website here. You'll see uh, the website for the School of Natural Sciences uh, at Trinity College, of which geography is a part. And you'll see at the bottom of the screen there the address for the geography website. That's the last slide now. So, uh, as you see, this is a quote from Michael Palin. You can travel the seas, poles and deserts and see nothing. To really understand the world, you need to get under the skin of the people and places. In other words, learn about geography. This podcast was brought to you by Trinity College Dublin.